I'd like to speak tonight on this subject, none of these things move me. Would you say that phrase with me, please? None of these things move me. I heard about a lady that announced she was going to start a diet and uh, to lose some pounds to eat healthier. And uh, her name was Mary. And her, her friend Sue said, great. She said, I'm going to start a diet too. She said, we can be dieting buddies and help each other out. And she said, when I feel the urge uh, to go to in and out I'll call you first. And Mary said, good, and I'll go with you. And so, you know, sometimes we have the best intentions, but then we get moved from our best intentions. So tonight is a night that I would like to encourage our church to stay uh, with those things that God has called us to as a church. And so Acts 20 and verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I, have come, that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the wonderful testimony of the Apostle Paul, a man who finished his course with joy. Father, we do not know in this room who will finish their course, much less finish it with joy. But we pray tonight that this message would be a help to all of us that we might finish. We know of many men in the Bible that did not finish well. We think of Samson. Uh, we think of Achan. We think of those that you tell us in the Bible did not finish well. But then, Lord, we know of others who were faithful unto death. And God, I pray that we would be a faithful church, that you would help us by your grace to stand. And so, Lord, use the message again, I pray, to that end. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. We live in a day of constant mobility. The average urban church has about 10% of its congregation move annually. That means that for Lancaster Baptist Church, we must see minimally 500 people baptized every year in order to stay even in our attendance, simply based upon the mobility of the society in which we live. A recent Gallup poll indicated that the average American moves every five years. We live in a mobile society. Now that is not always wrong, and I'm not condemning that. I moved here 32 years ago, and I'm glad I did. I thank the Lord for the calling of God. Uh, one of our associate pastors, Brother John Guy, will be moving over to the city of, of Phoenix area and, uh, and following God's leading in his life, and I'm thankful for that. But there are many today who, in their moving about, are not necessarily moving with spiritual reasoning in mind. It is oftentimes through a season of discouragement or through a response to some situation that suddenly the mobility begins to take place. Sometimes people are simply restless. Sometimes pastors get restless. And many times, and you've heard me say this, the average pastor will stay even only about five years himself in the local church where he was called to serve. Studies have also shown that large percentage of pastors resign after their first major building program. I've studied the scriptures. I believe that may be why Noah got drunk after he built the ark. I'm not sure, but I've often wondered if that had anything to do with it. Many today are moving not only locationally, but we live in a day of great change where people are moving positionally 
from positions they once claimed to believe in the Bible. So there is a lot of change today in the world in which we live. And I would say tonight, as we come to this passage, we're seeing a man who knew about all of the ebb and flow and pulls that would come into his life, but he declares to us, none of these things move me. Here, at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, he calls the elders together from the church at Ephesus. He calls them to the place known as Miletus. He wanted to meet with them before he went to Jerusalem. And so he called these pastors to come, and he is recounting with them the ministry there in the city of Ephesus. Luke, as we know, is the human author of the book of Acts. And as Luke is quoting here the words of the Apostle Paul, we hear this amazing statement from an apostle born out of due time. He describes all of the challenges of Ephesus, and then he says, but none of these things move me. Now, may I say to you tonight, I do not know how Satan is tempting to move you. I do not know what it is he doesn't want you to stand for. I don't know how he pushes you or what your buttons are. I just know the devil's pushy, and he's always trying to get us out of the joy of the Lord, out of the will of the Lord. He's constantly trying to take us from being that lively stone to being that missing stone in the wall of the house of God, if you will. Many today are walking away from serving God, and some are moving to a state of bitterness in their heart. And sometimes we've seen people who simply just step away from the things of God entirely. And so tonight I want you to hear the testimony of a man who had every reason to quit, to move, to change. And yet, by the grace of God, he could write and say, none of these things will move me. I want to give you three simple thoughts tonight from the Scriptures. The first thought I want you to see from the Apostle Paul's testimony is that he tells us that people would not move him. He was not going to let people move him from the will of God for his life. Notice, please, in verse 18 of our text. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I have came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears, and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews." Now, something that I was never taught in Bible college and something no one ever told you when you first got saved is that when you get saved, there are going to be trials and challenges and disappointments in your life. There will be people that will disappoint you. There will be situations that disappoint you. And Paul mentions in this verse number 19 specifically, the lying in wait of the Jews. Acts chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible says, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Now, I've had some difficult days with people, but I've never had what the Apostle Paul had at Lystra, where he was stoned and left for dead. Everywhere he went, there were people that followed him and literally wanted him dead because he preached even something as basic as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 14 and 19, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Here he tells us that there were people that were adamantly against his ministry to the extent that they wanted him gone in that way. But what did Paul do? Did he go to a seminar to figure out a new method? Did he call his apostles' union? Did he find a different or easier way? The fact that he was being opposed by people, how did that change him? 
I want you to notice, first of all, he continued serving. The Bible says in verse number 19 that with humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, he was serving the Lord, verse 19 says. Serving is a present participle. It tells us that he was in an ongoing fashion of service. He was constantly serving the Lord, and he continually served the Lord, and he continually served because his focus was the Lord. And I want all of you to see this tonight in verse 19. It says here, serving the Lord. Would you say that with me, please? Serving the... Say it again. Many times people can come into the culture of a church and they see other people are busy and other people are singing and other people are serving and, and that's not all wrong. Thank God for good modeling. But you should not just do what you're doing because other people are doing it. You should not do what you're doing because pastor encourages it or because uh, your Sunday school teacher is. Thank God for encouragement to do these things and to serve God. But we should always remember who we're serving and why we're serving. And Paul did not quit because he wasn't serving people. He was serving Jesus. That is critical to a church that will serve for 20 and 30 and 40 years. Over that period of time, you will find who is serving for Jesus and who got caught up just in the culture of service. And there is a difference I make no apologies for having a culture of service, for Jesus teaches us to serve. But may we be careful that we're not merely caught up in the culture of service. May we serve the Christ who served us. Serving the Lord. He was a servant-hearted, compassionate leader. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but our own souls, because you were dear unto us. You listen to me. The apostle Paul didn't say, well, all right. Everywhere I go, people bother me, but I'm called, you know, to do this. I mean, Jesus told me to do it on the road to Damascus. So open your Bibles and I'll open my quarterly. In the beginning, God. You know what that is? That's the creation. That was not his attitude. I have seen Christians who get to that place of feeling trapped. Let me tell you something. No one's trapping you. Jesus isn't trapping you. Listen, if there's someone here tonight say, I just don't feel like I'm going to sing in the choir. Get this loud and clear from your pastor. Then don't. You know how I want singing in the choir? People that believe Jesus wants them to sing in the choir. So I just feel like I'm going to disappoint. Then that's an issue that you've got to deal with, my friend, and give to the Lord. But friend, the fact of the matter is we're here. We're here to serve Jesus tonight. And Paul said, I'm not going to let people keep me from serving Jesus. And he served him, if you'll notice in that verse, with humility. Tozer said, we have become so engrossed in the work of the Lord that sometimes we forget the Lord of the work. How many of you can understand what that means? How many of you have ever been there? And you kind of have to pull aside to the altar and say, Lord, would you forgive me? I've been so focused on what I do, I kind of forgot why I was doing it. Have you ever been there? I've been there. Some of you that are new and trying to figure out why you do what you do, what you're experiencing is something all of us have experienced. And you go through seasons where you have to pull back and you've got to refocus on Jesus. But here we see a man that was simply telling us, yeah, people hated me. They stoned me. They, they wanted me dead. But I wasn't doing what I did for those people. I was doing it for the one that died for me. With humility and with compassion, he said, with many tears I cease not to warn you. He continued serving. He continued sowing. Notice if you would in verse 20, it says, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Here we see his manner publicly and from house to house. And, and, and this is what we've tried to do. Even as Paul was in Ephesus, we've tried to have a special outreach Saturdays or love works or, or door knocking or take some bread to someone at work or take a cookie or whatever in the world. What's it all about? It's all about just sowing the seed and sowing 
planting the seed. And I'm going to tell you something I said 32 years ago. I believe in a balanced ministry. I believe Jesus was full of grace and truth. I believe that we ought not simply have rules, but we ought to also have relationships with our children. I believe we ought not to simply have soul winning, but we ought to have discipleship. I believe we ought not to simply have the commandments of the Bible, but we ought to be walking in the spirit of the Lord. I've said for years I want to have a balanced ministry, but I've always said this. If I'm going to be out of balance in any one area, I want to be out of balance in this area of preaching the gospel and trying to get sinners saved and on their way to heaven. I'd rather be out of balance trying to rescue the perishing than in any other area you could name. Paul was a man who kept sowing publicly. He kept preaching the message. Look at his message, verse 20, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a volitional turning from something to something else. And and, and, and repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. When someone's turning from something, they're turning to Jesus. And and Paul was just preaching, turn away from uh, your pagan religion and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul the Apostle tells us in this passage, he says, there were men always waiting to harm him. There were those always coming against him. Yet he said, none of those things move me. I will not let people move me. I'll not let the fact that the Jews want to kill me stop me. He said, people will not move me. But notice, secondly, tonight, he testifies to these Ephesian elders, problems will not move me. Problems will not move me. Sometimes people move because other people have created issues. And sometimes problems come into our lives. Verse 22, now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, please notice this phrase, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Verse 23, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. This amazes me because we don't hear many people saying, that's it, I'm done with California, I'm out of here, I'm moving to Africa to be a missionary. I never hear it that way. No one's ever come to me and said, I'm tired of this liberal state, it's just this last law, you know, uh, Governor Moonbeam or whatever they want to talk about. I'm tired of it. I'm going to Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. That's where I'm going. No, I don't hear that either. Here we see the problems that Paul experienced didn't lead him to his perceived problem-free utopia somewhere. They led him right back into more problems. Look at what it says here. Again, verse 23, saying, bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know exactly what's going to happen in Jerusalem. I just know that they'll probably put me in jail there too. (laughs) How many of you understand then, this was a spiritual motivation. He wasn't going to Jerusalem to see the pool of Bethesda or to see, you know, Solomon's handiwork. He was going to preach the gospel and, and he said, I know there's going to be problems there. They'll probably, they'll probably throw me in jail there too. But he, he said something very unique and I, I want you to notice it. He tells us in verse 22, he says, but I am bound in the spirit. May I say to you tonight, the proper time to make adjustments in your life is when you're bound by the Holy Spirit, there's the advancement of God's work in this matter. Paul was bound in the Spirit. Factually, great Christians in the center of God's will will have problems. They'll have opposition. 32 years ago, I had really no idea of some of what it was going to be like to be a pastor. I was telling Brother Guy the other day, read this book. Years ago, the deacons, remember I I gave the book to the deacons, Pastors at Risk by H.P. London just kind of outlining some of the challenges pastors face so the deacons would know maybe just some things to pray for in my life. I I had no idea. I I thought everybody would kind of be glad there was a church and 
preaching and buses and souls getting saved. And I, I thought that would be a great thing. I, I didn't know there would be at times picker, picketers or uh, bloggers or death threats or people that would have cancer that you loved. And I, I didn't know about sometimes criticism that would come. I, I didn't know about sometimes things that people would say or do. I didn't know sometimes on Christmas morning we'd get some hate mail on our front door. Had no idea those kinds of things would come. Didn't know some of the, the pressures of loving people and loving people and then seeing them fall away from the things of God. Thank God for the thousands that are faithful. And, and I thank God for that tonight. But I had no idea uh, the problems that would come. But I, I can tell you this, my friend. When I came to Lancaster, I was bound in the Spirit to come here. And I didn't come here expecting that everything might be perfect. I had no idea idea some of the trials but I'm here tonight 32 years later why because I know who brought me here I came here bound by the Holy Spirit of God that this was his will bound here indicates the calling the the compelling of the Holy Spirit on someone's life Acts 23 and 11 says it this way. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. God had moved on his heart. And he was bound by the Lord. He would not let a problem get him out of doing what God had called him to do. Notice also in verse 22, he says, Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. Here was a man that was bound by God. Here was a man that was burdened for the things of God. He was bound in the spirit. In other words, this was more than a mental strategy. It's interesting to me how sometimes even in ministry, people have these great strategies, and sometimes it'll be in a book, and it'll be on a blog site, and, and it's, it's a lot of strategic planning, which is vitally needed. But what is needed more is the in, in, internal working of God in our hearts. And here was a man that had been moved by God. And Acts chapter 18 and verse 5 explains it this way. Paul being pressed in his spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Paul wrote to the church at Rome just before his final journey to Jerusalem. And this is how he explained it to them. He said in Romans 9, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. How I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He said, there's nothing else that I could do. Over the years, I've counseled sometimes with guys that they're going through a rough patch in their job and someone else got a promotion and they didn't get it. And they'll come and say, you know, pastor, it's been kind of tough over there at Northrop. I've been thinking about, you know, a one day a week job like being a pastor. How do you know if maybe you're supposed to be a pastor? And often say this, if there is no way that you can escape the desire to preach, if you're preaching to the mirror, if you're preaching to the dog, if you're preaching to the cat, if you're preaching everywhere you go, and it's just all over you, and you cannot escape the fact that God wants you to preach the Word of God, and you know that God has put this upon you, then, then you may be getting the type of burden that is required with the calling of God to be involved in the ministry. Paul was bound in his spirit you know what I have found? God blesses a man and a woman with a burden for souls. God is looking for people who are bound in their spirit to share the gospel. And God has a way of blessing, and I think back and been praying for Brother Keller this week so much, Brother Steve, and I think back to the day that you were saved out there at Edwards Air Force Base. I've been reliving it in my mind when you prayed to accept Jesus as your Savior, and I was thinking about the college graduation the other day and seeing uh, Daniel Chenard come and graduate from college and remembering when his daddy graduated from Lancaster Baptist High School and just saying, thank you, Lord, that you brought me here and you've kept me here all these years, and I was thinking when Reese Alvarez 
Gomez graduated from high school the other night, how his own mother graduated from this very high school. And I just said, God, thank you that I didn't just come to try to learn a few things. I remember years ago, Jack Hiles telling me, well, he said, I went to a church in Texas and I made my mistakes there. And then I went on to do my life's work. And, and I remember saying to myself and didn't say it publicly to him. I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I thought I'll make my mistakes in Lancaster, but I'm going to make Lancaster my life's work. I didn't come here for a little stepping stone. God brought me to this place bound in the spirit. I get tickled. Someone said to me a few months ago, looks to me like maybe you're kind of, you know, getting to an age where you probably ought to start thinking about retirement. <laughs> Preachers don't retire, folks. <laughs> I imagine I'll have to delegate a little more of these upcoming years and figure out how to preserve my health a little bit. And there may come days when we'll have pe more people doing different things, but I'm going to tell you something. I didn't come here as a stepping stone for another church. I didn't come here as a stepping stone for retirement. When God calls a man to preach, he is faithful unto death for Jesus Christ. Good night. Donald Trump's 70 something, he's just getting going. You haven't noticed the guy's got energy. And I know some say, well, I don't like all his energy. I, I don't know, he gets it from Big Macs. I'm not sure where he gets it. But. He's probably not the best illustration. Some of you, your minds are going everywhere right now. Okay, Ronald Reagan was elected when he was in his 70s. I mean, good night. Somebody's like, Pastor, we'll be bringing your Geritol and your wheelchair to get you to the back. I'm 56 years old, people. I mean, if you want me to join the basketball league and prove something, I can do that. Yeah, I mean, what's, I don't know what's going to take to help some of you out there. Maybe we'll start a church boxing league. I would really enjoy that with some of you. Just kidding. I'm just saying, when God puts a call on a man's life, a man's not looking for when do you get out of it. A man's looking for how can I stay involved for my Savior. This was Paul. He had this burden. I was thinking as I went to my niece's wedding Friday. Oh, that was so much fun. Not, not weddings. I mean, the wedding was fine. I told Chandler, he was sitting next to me. I said, Chandler, I'm going to tell you right now. It happens every time. They're going to kiss. <laughs> and Chandler went, really? <laughs> and sure enough, when they got ready to kiss, he went, <laughs> just like that. The funnest part for me was just watching my brother cry the whole time. I didn't just cry the whole time. I cried the day before and the day after. <laughs> but here was another young family that met here that you encouraged, a basketball player that you cheered who's been called to preach. You see, that's the burden of the ministry, to see people saved and baptized and trained. And, and over the years, yes, there may be difficulties and there may, may be contrary type people and there may be uh, different problems that come, but somewhere along the line, we've got to say, by the grace of God, I shall not be moved. And God, help me to be faithful. Paul said, people won't move me. He said, problems won't move me. I don't know what's in Jerusalem. I just know they're going to, they're lying in wait for me there too. How many of you sense that has to be the calling of God? Because if we knew that someone was waiting to shoot at us, we might say, I think God's calling me to another city right now. But God was calling him there. People won't move me. Problems won't move me. And I bring you really to the most important part of this message tonight. It's the part that has helped me the most. And I want it to help you. Pride will not move me. Pride will not move me. Can I show you something here in verse 24? But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. 
Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Let's say that together. Neither count. Now, when I get ready to almost make a wrong decision, it's normally because I'm thinking about me too much. Tragically, most men do not leave the ministry because of people problems or problems, but because of pride. Thinking to themselves as a pastor, I don't deserve that. I'm tired of that. Or thinking as a husband may think. She doesn't know what she has in me. She doesn't appreciate me. I deserve more than that. Or as a wife, the same. And sometimes those thoughts can well up. And sometimes we start our ministry in our Christian life in awe of God and in awe of Jesus. But the idol of self moves in and we begin to think, you know what? I need more me time. I don't need this. I don't, I don't need someone telling me what to do. And, and Paul said, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Sometimes people say to me, well, you know, I'm just kind of a people pleaser. Can I just say something? That may or may not be true. And, and, and certainly there are people that are like that. But I see a bigger problem. It's not that we are people pleasers. It's that we are pleasing our own self. Because we want to feel good about the situation. But Paul said, I don't count myself dear unto myself. Sometimes we have to face the fact that the greatest danger to our spiritual life is our self. Thinking about our self. Now notice what he says. He did not value his will over God's ministry. 1 Timothy 1 and 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. So we see here in verse number 24, he says, he says, neither count I my life. So we have an accounting here. We have, uh, the other day, we had the, the CPA of the church giving the report to the deacons, giving an accounting. And Paul here is making a reckoning or an accounting concerning his life and his ministry. And, and as he speaks of it, he tells us, here. I don't value my will over God's will. What matters more to me is the will of God. And by the way, the only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. If I think more about myself, surely I will be less involved in the lives of others, including your own family, much less the church or the choir. But when I'm thinking of Christ, I delight in serving Christ. As the Apostle Paul said, when I think of Christ, the love of Christ constraineth me. That if one died for all, then all were dead. And it's because of that that I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we think of self, we do not want to serve. But when we think of Christ, we're compelled and joyous in our service. You see, oftentimes this pride of which I speak, this this counting our life dear to ourself. I deserve a better situation. Oftentimes, it's the root of why we compromise in our life. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. When we consider our life dear unto ourselves, we kind of want to blend in with the world and be accepted by the world. We don't want to be one of those you know, Christians that's kind of standing out as a Christian because that's, that's not cool. I've got to consider my image. What are people going to think of me? How's this going to feel to me? It may be a teenager who takes a drink for acceptance. It, it, it may be someone else that's, that's somehow adapting to ungodliness in some way. I'm just saying, when we're thinking of ourselves, we're more prone to compromise along the way. Pride is the root of compromise, and sometimes pride is the root of contention. The Bible says only by pride cometh contention. In other words, what I find is that when people are focused on themselves, they begin to have problems with everybody else. If you're with me on that, say amen. When a man focuses on his needs, then he's upset with his wife because she's not meeting his need. When a man focuses on his comfort rather than his calling, he's frustrated at his work. He's frustrated in his environment 
because he's considering himself and how it feels rather than considering Christ and what Christ might want him to do to make a difference. And he gets frustrated in his situation. And Paul said, the reason I was not frustrated, the reason I did not quit is because I did this reckoning. And he said, I reckon that it's not about me anyways. And, and he says, I reckon that the ministry is not about my comfort zone. It's about God's calling. And, and so rather than being filled with pride and saying, enough of this junk, I'm out of here. He said, I didn't count myself dear unto myself. Now we live in a world that has self magazines and it's all about self. But Paul said, that wasn't my thought process. He did not value his will over God's ministry. He did not value himself over Christ's message. He thought getting Christ's message out was the ultimate in his life. Look at verse 24, what it says. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Why? so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Now, now Paul could have boasted. He could have called a card, called in a card on his rank. Paul, in the world sense, was a somebody. Philippians 3, 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He said, I've kind of thought through this. He said, I'm not going to let pride be the driving force in my life. It's not going to be about me anymore. It's going to be about Jesus from now on. And that's not something that you have to like think about a lot and commiserate about a lot and go through a big whole process. You can simply make that decision tonight. Jesus, for the rest of my life, I want you to be at the center. I want to serve you. I want it to all be about you. I don't want it to be about others' opinions or my opinion. I don't want it to be about my insecurity or my people pleasing. Jesus, I want this to be all about you. You can do that with God's grace beginning tonight. This was Paul's heart. He said, neither can I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy. Now, would you just look at that for a moment? That I might finish my course. How many of you want to finish whatever the course is that God has for you? How many of you want to do that? I do. But as I said in the first service this morning, how many of you want to finish your course with joy? Now, folks, let me tell you something. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And what's the next one? Joy. Paul didn't just say, all right, I'm going to finish. You people listen to me. He didn't just say, well, I'm stuck with this because it would look bad if I quit. I'm an apostle. Apostles can't quit, so I'm going to finish. He finished with what? Joy. Some of you have been saved long enough now You've been following the Lord, but sometimes we have kicks and dents we didn't expect in the the Christian life. And the devil wants to suck joy right out of us when those things happen. But again, we have to come back to this place. You know, it was never really about me in the first place. I'm supposed to die to self. He did not value himself over Christ's message. You know, something about God that amazes me when I meditate on his attributes And I do that often in my devotions. I often think about the immutability of God. We have an unchanging God. I am the Lord. Say the rest with me. I change not. Tonight, if I'm going to make it to the 33rd and the 35th, and if I'm going to be faithful for years to come, and if you're going to be faithful for years to come, we better keep our eyes on the Lord. He doesn't change. We better determine that we will not let people stop us. You say, there's a lot of wacky people here. There's going to be wacky people everywhere, my friend. There's a lot of problems. There's problems everywhere. But the real reason that people change and the real reason that so much mobility abounds is because we count our lives dear unto ourself. We're looking for the easy way out. I don't know about you tonight. I don't want to be a used to be a pastor. 
There may be a day when I'm not senior pastor. I, I, I promise you this, I'll still be preaching around here and running up some of you guys and bugging you about something or another just because I feel like you might look like you need it. But I don't want to be a used to be preacher. I don't want to be a used to be soul winner. I don't want to be, boy, he used to be so involved in missions. I don't want to be a used to be a good dad or husband. I don't want to be a used to be a Baptist, used to be faithful, got caught up in that whim or that whim. I don't want to get off in some pharisaical extreme or hyper grace extreme or some, some tangent somehow. I don't want to be a used to be a Bible preacher. I want to be faithful to my Lord Jesus Christ. And we're all susceptible to this matter of pride. We're all susceptible to thinking, you know, there's got to be something better. I get tickled watching some, some folks even in their 70s and 80s. No disrespect here. How many facelifts until you're going to be happy? I'm not preaching against facelifts either. I'm just preaching against multiple facelifts. How many houses? How many this? How many experiences? How many moves? How many marriages? Until we figure out the only true happiness is found in Jesus. How can we continue in sin when he died for sin? How can we continue serving self when we're to die to self? I ask you, What's at the root of it for you? None of these things move me, Paul said. Neither count I my life dear to myself. Too many Christians make big decisions and many times wrong decisions because they're focused on self and not their Savior. You'll never make a wrong decision focused on the Savior. Paul the Apostle said, none of these things move me. I know they're lying in wait to kill me again, but... None of these things move me. Those people aren't going to stop me. Those problems aren't going to stop me. My own pride's not going to stop me. Why? Because I'm bound in the Spirit. My wife, Terry, is is the most wonderful lady in the world, and I, I I love her spiritual influence. She doesn't gossip. She, she doesn't speak ill of people. The closest she's ever made in all of our 32 years to making any comment to me is whenever she hears, and I don't bring everything home from the office, I don't even bring it to this pulpit. I, when I'm going through a lot of things and challenges and inequities in my life, I don't bring it to the pulpit. I've had a bucket load of them the last year or so. You've never heard one time. And sometimes when Terry hears a little bit, she'll simply say this to me. Why can't people just be spiritual? Just be spiritual. And I believe the Apostle Paul, other than Jesus, may have been the most spiritual person that ever lived. Because if you read the text and watch his life, it wasn't about him. It was all about Jesus Christ. I don't know. I haven't been listening inside of your house. I don't know what you're going through. But there might be someone here tonight who needs to make this decision. None of these things, people, problems, or pride, are going to move me from the will of God. None of these things will move me from the will of God.